this is part of a retrospective of Polish cult comedies uh, from communist times. And this retrospective is part of my research. Uh, my name is Anna Draniewicz, and uh, I am researching if humor can be a tool of fight against the regime, a form of peaceful protest, or merely a safety belt. Um, according to the relief theory of humor, uh, it can play a therapeutic and cathartic role. Uh, Sigmund Freud believed that it allows people to express forbidden thoughts and therefore is a coping me mechanism. So in Soviet bloc, the laughter was giving people the feeling of freedom. It was helping with, uh, with integration and bond forming. And thanks to that, they were allowed to see that they are not alone and then uh, organize and fight uh, the regime. So uh, today I will just give you the link right now in the chat. And I will talk a little bit more about the film after. I, those who come back uh, after the last three days, you already know a lot about the director. You kind of know what to expect. This is his masterpiece, the best film uh, by everybody's, um, uh, both um, the critics and the public decided that this is like the, the top, the, the highlight of his career. So um, it's like a patchwork a little bit. And um, you will see a lot happening on the side of the main um, story, but it's all connected. So just follow it until it finishes and then it all will fall into, pieces, uh, into place, I, prom I promise. <laughs> yeah, it will fall into place, not into pieces. You should be able to see right now the link and the password. So we have one hour and 55 minutes. The film is one hour and five minutes. Uh, when you come back, please start asking questions in the Q&A uh, box. Uh, and uh, sharply at 8 Eastern time, we will come back here and I will answer your questions, which is exactly in one hour, 55 minutes. Uh, I wish you a very nice uh, experience with this film then. And I will see you soon. Thank you. Okay, so I will talk a little bit about the film uh, first before I start answering questions. Um, first of all, uh, I wanted to mention that um, this film, uh, as you could see, was partly made in London. So they did go to Heathrow and then to London itself. Um, but because of uh, the money uh, that they had allocated for the film, they couldn't spend too much. And just like in case of Paris uh, in the film yesterday, it was similar here. All the um, scenes that are happening in London and at the Heathrow Airport were um, possible thanks to help of some Polish people living there. Uh, the airport was actually um, reconstructed in Warsaw in one of the high risers, uh, new buildings that looked like uh, the Western building and they had um, extra um, extras, people um, working in embassies or, or um, being foreigners. They were the only ones who would get the extra job in that scene because they had to be dressed in a Western way. They had to have nice clothes, they had to look uh, foreign. So um, people who work in this building, which was a, um, a building where there were uh, um, international companies, they were playing the passengers and they put signs everywhere, uh, arrivals, departures, and they pretend that this is the inside of the Heathrow um, airport. So um, another thing about the um, scenes in London, uh, is that first of all, only a small uh, crew could go, again, because of the money, because of the cost. So only the main actors and the director, and that meant that they had to play all of the roles. So we actually see the director, Stanisław Bareja, very well in this film, not like yesterday, just for a few seconds. Uh, he's actually playing Mr. Janek, the, the owner of the Polish delicatessen, Polish foods shop in London. Obviously, there are such shops there. This one that they filmed was an existing shop. Uh, they didn't have to make it, but uh, the director was playing uh, the owner, uh, um, a Pole who moved to, uh, to London and who was living there, but obviously he could speak Polish. 
Then he also had a, a lady who was working for him and she was the one who translated for the protagonist in the bank. Uh, so she could speak uh, not very good Polish, but you know, you could understand uh, what she says. Um, and she could obviously speak very good English. So she was able to tell him that they are on strike and he has to wait a few more minutes because they will not uh, cash his check until uh, 2 p.m. And then we have a very funny scene when he's saying, oh, they are so spoiled here, they have a strike and they have so much bureaucracy. Now, obviously, communist Poland had much more bureaucracy. Uh, we were not able to strike, that was forbidden. Uh, so him ranting about that, it makes, makes it funny for us, you know, back then and even now watching it, uh, we know that this is like, you know, exaggeration. I mean, he shouldn't be angry. I think him saying, oh, they strike, it's even more maybe being envious that they can strike uh, than, than being angry uh, at them. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, the director was actually playing a role which also helped him to uh, earn some extra money this way because he was paid for playing that little, you know, uh, episodical role. So I can, uh, like, like um, uh, having just few few sentences to say, but that helped him to earn because obviously all those films, especially the ones that he was making, entertaining ones, comedies, uh, he was not paid very well. The artistic um, value of those films by the committees who watched them um, and allowed to release them uh, was treated as worse. There was not, they were not art films, they were entertainment. So he would get the lower uh, point, which was number four, and that meant he would get less money than, let's say, Andrzej Wajda, the master of Polish cinema, who would make very, very serious uh, films. And I am mentioning uh, Vaida here because um, that year, 1981, when the film was released, it was made a year earlier, but it was released in 1981. Uh, Vaida's film, The Man of Ion, was number one, the most popular film, the most people bought tickets to see that one. And um, it's a very famous film who actually got the um, Palm d'Or, uh, the Golden Palm in, in Cannes that year. And it was also nominated for the Oscars the year after, um, uh, but it was just a nomination, it didn't get any awards. It was obviously nominated for the best foreign film. So uh, that was number one at the cinemas then. And Barea's film, The Teddy Bear, was number five. So you can imagine that it was very successful, just like all his films. Um, and it would maybe even have more viewers if the cinemas were not closed on the 13th of um, December 1981, when the martial law started. So, uh, you know, it was two more weeks when people normally would go to cinema and then he might be even jump, uh, jump into number four. Uh, we will never find out because uh, that was the time when the solidarity uh, was made illegal. Only a few months later, it was made legal. It was uh, the biggest workers union um, in the Eastern Europe. Or, or Central Europe, as we like to call it, in, sub, in the Soviet bloc, let's say. It's a, it had a lot, uh, around six million uh, members, the Solidarity Union. Uh, and um, Barea was lucky this time with this film uh, because uh, when the, he finished the film, uh, it was the time of change in Poland. It was the time of the so-called so Solidarity Carnival, and that meant that the censors, the censorship, was busy much more with other stuff. And also it was a moment of hope and change and, and people were asking for the censorship to, to be um, less, uh, smaller and not, you know, uh, getting into everything uh, and destroying everything really. Because what happened with that film was that after it was finished and before the Solidarity Carnival started, uh, as usual, it was viewed by uh, a committee of filmmakers and censors, and they decided that the director needs to cut off all, over 30 scenes of that film. They didn't like all parts of those scenes. They didn't like all the allusions about the tradition. We will talk about that maybe later, what's the meaning of the word tradition and the tradition itself in that film. They didn't like um, showing uh, Polish meat, uh, ham, they didn't like uh, the girl in the British shop saying that this ham, Polish ham, is very juicy. There was no ham in the shops in, in Poland, 
because it was um, uh, exported to the West, uh, because that way the party would get money. Uh, so that was something they didn't want to show. Uh, there is a lot of uh, scenes that we see in this film that were supposed to be cut off. But as I said, Varea was lucky this time and uh, his film was not cut for the first time uh, and the last time. <laughs> um, because the, this time the solidarity took over and as I said, the situation in the country has changed. So this film was released uh, in the same, uh, that's why it's longer than the other ones as well. I guess they made it that long knowing that some parts will be cut uh, and make it uh, shorter. So what we see is really uh, what he wanted to do. And maybe that's also why it became the most popular film by Barea, because here finally the censors uh, didn't uh, you know, change anything. So he, didn't have to later play with everything and put it into place so it makes sense. Here, everything was very well thought through. I know it might have been a little bit hard to watch because of uh, everything happening. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot in there. It's as if he tried to put everything in this one film um, and he never made any other feature film after that. As I mentioned before, he only did two TV series um that was shown in the 80s and then he died in 1987 before the system changed so this film really shows the variety of, of polish society uh, when um, um Barea was talking about this film uh, in the, on the radio he said it's a film about uh, the, the the lies about the fact that everybody lies obviously the protagonist the main character here lies and he's using people um everybody around him for his own gain. Um, so it's the, the film about the, the lack of truth. Um, I will stop for a second here because, um, and before I do the, the questions, there's just a few more things I wanted to mention. Uh, I mentioned that he, Barea was in the scene in London and he got paid for that. Another way uh, for getting extra money was by um, hiring uh, the members of the family. We see his daughter in one scene here. She also appeared very shortly yesterday in the film. She only says one line, but if you have a line in a film, you already get paid more than as an extra. So as an extra, you get less, but as a line, um, if you have a line that you're already an actor, so it's better paid. And then there is one scene in which we see his uh, son as well. And he also says one line. He's the boy who's counting people in the line and tells the gentleman on the phone, our photographer from yesterday film, that there's 20, 121 people waiting. And the daughter is playing a secretary who's talking to a lady who's um, bringing uh, meat. So meat is everywhere. As I mentioned yesterday, there was shortage of meat. So this problem of meat of la or lack of meat is in that film. You might remember the scene when um, a, a lady who's, who sells newspapers uh, also sells meat, but from under the counter, as we call it. So it's a black market. Uh, think really. He, he, only people who know that she has meat can come uh, and buy it. And that was the case, unfortunately. Even in the scene in the theater, when we see big, really big hams um, on the scene, a, a father says to his son, look, this is what ham looks like, because the poor son never seen it until the system changed and we get again everything in the shops. Um, so that was just like a, a, li a little funny thing to tell you that, yeah, um, members of his family was in this film and he also used his son and daughter in other films a little bit as well. But also the um, father of Stanisław Tym, uh, the actor who's playing the main two roles of himself uh, and the lookalike, and the one we've seen in last film yesterday as Dudawa and the week, day before as Zenek. Uh, his father is playing the hairdresser who shaves him. So he's shaving his, his own son, son's hair in that scene. And then his brother is at the end uh, walking at this little lake. So they obviously also got paid this way. And that was just a way to, you know, get some money uh, on the side. Okay, um, I think it's time to move to the questions now. So as I said, there was a lot in this film. And I try to explain anything that might, you know, be um, 
weird um, and you're not sure why it was shown. The first question is, regarding the restaurant that had tables and spoons attached to the tables, did such restaurants exist? Who ate in them? Okay, yes, so this is a very famous scene from that film. Uh, they have uh, um, spoons on chains. Uh, now, this is a little bit exaggerated. So Varea did exaggerate sometimes a little bit for the, for the humoristic effect. And that's one of them. So we never had uh, milky bars like that. This scene is happening in milky bar. We had milky bars. They were very similar. Everything was very similar in real life, except for the chains. We did, uh, um, uh, although, have uh, something called, uh, called saturatory. Uh, that was um, like a little van uh, in the street during the summer where you could buy um, sparkling water. So it was a special machine that would make it sparkly and you could pay. And that's where you had a glass on a chain. Uh, that might sound a little bit disgusting, and uh, it was. Uh, but what would you do would be you'd be paying, and then they would put this uh, water, and you would drink it, and that was it, and you would go, and next person would come. But because it was water, then obviously they kind of uh, wash it with it as well, right? So it wasn't maybe very well washed, but it was washed. Um, some people were saying that this is the easiest way to uh, to get disease if you if you drink from from them. But, you know, maybe actually we didn't need vaccine because of that uh, for some of the <laughs> uh, illnesses because I remember as a child drinking it and, well, I'm still alive. So, no, we didn't have spoons uh, attached to the tables. That was the only thing they added. And that was something that the sensors didn't like as well. They wanted this scene to be cut off. Fortunately for us, it is a very funny scene, even though it is disgusting. Uh, another thing is uh, one guy in that scene is asking for puree. It's obviously potato puree and he wants it with lard, but he, they say, oh, we don't have lard today, it's with jam. So you have uh, potato puree with jam. You know, that doesn't sound very, uh, very yeah, um, delicious. So those kind of milky bars did exist. Uh, they had very cheap comfort food. Um, now we have a renaissance of them, which means they were closed after the system change, but very many people reopen them now, uh, make them look like from communist times. Uh, but they are actually quite healthy, uh, not expensive, so it's like this street kind of food um, or, or fast food uh, in, in poly Polish version. Much healthier than the real fast food though. Okay, let's move to the next question. And this actually is a scene that was at the very beginning, so I should have started with that. There was a long line of cars in a checkpoint. What were the police checking? Why were the three facades of houses erected? Okay, so that's how the film starts. Um, yeah, this is another funny scene in which the policemen are putting um, fake houses up uh, just to, to stop people and uh, get money from them, find them, right? So they were getting fined. So people who would drive that way every day, they knew there was never any, any house around that. Now, if you have houses, at up to three houses or more, it's counted as a, as a village. And in a village, you have to go slower than outside the village. So the way they were tricking uh, the poor drivers to, to find them and to get money from them, was by pretending that now there is a village here. And some people were saying, but yesterday there was nothing, you know, and you could see it's fake and the people were not moving because they were mannequins. Uh, but it was just, first of all, to get the money and secondly, to kind of check, uh, you know, if, if the citizens are always alert. Uh, and that uh, scene already is, um, is a reason for, for a few jokes uh, because in one scene, uh, they say, when, when somebody says, okay, there was no, no, no houses yesterday, they say, what if uh, your mother was passing the street uh, and you wouldn't stop because there was no houses yesterday? And he says, but the, my mother is at the back of the car. I could not drive through her, you know. So then they say, oh, he says it at the back of the car. So now we have to change it. So we say, what about if your son, and don't tell me you don't have a son because you might have one day. And check if it's not a priest, because if it's a priest, obviously you cannot use this um, excuse. And similar scene later happens at the airport. 
when we have a, a security guy who's also having a manual with all those excuses, he's just looking. If it's a mother, okay, mother, you can just wave to her and, and you cannot get in. You know, and all, all those little, little scenes like that are just for, for, for the humor. Uh, so the line of cars was because they would stop all of them practically and they would just find them and uh, yeah. And this way they were earning uh, the money that they needed. The system needed money because, you know, never had enough. Okay, next question. What kind of place was it that looked like a warehouse with a wet floor? The, third, the three men went to drink there and avoid searching for the double. There was a man there giving vodka for watches. What kind of place was it? Okay, that's a very interesting place in Warsaw. It was um, a building that was supposed to serve for circus. So whenever a cirque will come to town, uh, they could use the, the build, uh, building instead of uh, putting a tent up uh, like everywhere else, you know, because the Warsaw, Warsaw was the capital and they decided we need a, a tent for circus, which was back then very popular, not so much now. Uh, so they actually plan, uh, paid a lot of money to some Bulgarian architects to build that building in Povishle, which is a part of Warsaw, a quarter of, of Warsaw. Um, and then they would uh, build it, but as usually uh, the builders wouldn't care much and the building was not very good and it didn't, uh, you know, uh, pass the regulation of health and safety. They did use it once or twice and after that it was closed and just uh, fell into ruin. So uh, in that, at the time where they were uh, filming in there, it was already a place where, um, uh, let's say, uh, people from outside of the society would meet. So uh, yeah, you would have one person who was kind of working there. His work was to uh, um, warm up the place. Uh, uh, that, that, was, that was his job. He's even talking on the phone with a, with a woman who's calling saying, okay, are you, are you you know, putting some coil uh, in because we are cold. And he says, well, it's winter, so it has to be cold. It's a, a law of nature, right? Um, so that's another funny thing that people like to sell, say to each other when winter comes, you know, when somebody says, I'm cold, they say, well, it's winter, so it has to be cold, right? Um, so th that was a place where you, some people, not everybody, obviously, but they knew you could come and buy some vodka and then sit there. So it was like a, a bar but let's say illegal bar, um, not uh, surely not like a, you know, it was like a speakeasy, I think you call it here, right? Even though there was no prohibition outside, but um, yeah, it was not a governmental uh, thing for sure. So it was abandoned and it was just reused like a squat place by those people. Uh, and those three men obviously were working for the film, but they didn't feel like driving around all night and checking everybody to find the double. So they just, what they did, they moved them um, in the car, or how, how do you call it? The, the thing that shows how many kilometers you, you drove, right? They pushed it, which was possible in those cars back then, uh, further to prove that they did uh, that many kilometers. And then they signed that they went everywhere, but didn't find this gentleman, right? Uh, and they just had some, some vodka and that was it. They could go back uh, next day uh, to work. Uh, I hope that uh, explains this one. So it's, it was a very interesting place in Warsaw. After the system changed, it was just destroyed and now it's a, an apartment, a house, a house, you know, with apartments. Okay, can you explain the first part with the housing and the significance? I believe it's the same one I was just talking about, the uh, militia uh, putting up the houses. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a joke in a way. I mean, they use it as a joke. And obviously, militia wouldn't do that. That was another exaggeration a little bit. What they would do was uh, stopping people, uh, giving them fines whenever they needed money. There's actually another scene that shows that later um, in the film. You remember when we see um, the double uh, on the cart uh, with his friends and with the Christmas trees. Uh, they're going back to Warsaw and they are stopped by the policeman because the policeman can see, I'm sorry, militia men. We didn't have police, police we had militia instead. So he stops them because the, the horse is drunk and also dirty apparently. Um, but what happens is when they, he wants to give them a fine, they say, how about instead we give you the Christmas tree, you know, and you even save 30 zloty and, you know, it, it's good for you. 
And then he, second later, he, he calls them and he says, I, I, can I have another one for my brother? And they say, well, not have, but you can buy one. So another 200 is 30 zloty. Um, so what he does, uh, the, poli the militiamen, is uh, saying, just hold this one for a second, I'll be right back. What he means by that is he's gonna go to the road now, stop the first person coming, uh, tell them they did something wrong, and get the money, right, that he needs uh, for, the, for the second tree. Um, and we know that, I mean, it's not shown, we just, we just know that when we watch the film. And the, the, the funny bit in that scene is that we actually see a car coming with a Christmas tree on the top, on the roof, and when they see the, the militia men, they just turn around and go back uh, and, because they also know that the, he's going to stop them. They can see that he's already waiting for them. And you didn't have to do anything wrong. You know, you just couldn't um, uh, fight or argue with the militia men. That's all, right? So well, if he told you you did something uh, wrong, mm, that, that was it. <laughs> I mean, you could try to argue, but then you could end up in jail. And it was not a good idea. You rather pay and don't say anything. Um, so yeah, that explains the housing. I hope if that's the, the part uh, that you mean. Uh, if I didn't answer the question, please, uh, you know, um, ask a more uh, detailed question here, and I will do my best to answer that. Okay, the next question is: Can you explain the significance of the call and the exchange of call and? Uh, fir tree. Uh, okay, yes, that's another funny scene. And again, it's the, one of those scenes that suddenly appears, has nothing to do with the story itself. It's just an excuse for some jokes. So, uh, um, first of all, those men, uh, including the double of the, the character, the main character, uh, their job is to uh, transport coal. We used to have uh, men looking like that in the streets. Um, I mean, that was, that was something you would see. You won't see anything like this anymore right now. Um, so a coal was obviously used to warm the, um, some of the places and, and to cook. You know, a lot of houses were old houses and they would use coal. Um, so it was important to have it. Now, they, we, again, in the film, we realized that um, they um, not always get that coal in a legal way. They steal it from uh, trains that transport coal, coal or from other places. We actually hear them talking, you know, oh, uh, you know, it's militia, militia after us because of the Tuesday or, uh, that we got this, I don't know how many kilos, or is it about Friday or is it something else? So we know from their words that they are um, stealing that coal. Now, this is, there is this very important scene that starts. We have to go back a little bit for, uh, for me to explain it. So when the double shows up at the production of the film, because he saw the advertisement, they're looking for somebody looking like him, right? So he comes. But because the, the manager of the film thinks, the producer, he thinks this is his friend, uh, he, you know, they look so alike. Uh, that he has no idea and he already told everybody to leave so he thinks it's just his friend and he tells to him you know you were supposed to stay home the moment after this man leaves his friend calls him on the phone and says i am home right but he told this poor guy the double uh, don't leave the house go uh, pick up some mushrooms in the in the forest that was a crazy idea, but you know, he wanted to get him busy, so he disappeared, so nobody sees him because he was pretending to be ill. And that was the reason why they were looking for a look alike for the film. So it was all uh, very complicated. A, a lot of things there are complicated, everything is connected, right? So uh, this poor double guy leaves the place and he doesn't understand what happened. Why the man that he never saw in his life before says, uh, if you don't go to the uh, forest and look for some mushrooms, they will, uh, you know, put us both in jail because what they were doing was illegal, obviously. Uh, but he takes it as a sign. He says like, wow, he's a very clever guy. He must know what he's talking about. So he tells everybody at his cart to go to the, uh, that day to go to the forest, which means they just go outside Warsaw, right? So they go outside Warsaw and then we have a scene showing a family in the countryside in a house. 
and uh, here we have this exchange of uh, um, interesting uh, observations. Um, the woman who saw that the call, call came, the call transport came, runs to the house and, and shouts, uh, call is here, we have to go and get some, you know, uh, grab a bu bucket and whatever is there to get as much as possible because normally you, it was very hard to get it. That's why they were still in it. There was never enough. Um, one of the jokes from the communist times was that uh, 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 the exchange between Poland and the, the USSR was very simple. We would give them uh, meat and in return they would take our coal, you know, which meant that we were giving them everything. So yeah, the USSR would uh, take a lot from, uh, from all of the communist countries and the rest was sent to the exports for, for the foreign uh, currency. So there was a shortage of a lot of things and coal was one of them. So when the woman sees there is a coal transport and she can buy some, maybe first time in years, you know, uh, she runs, she calls everybody. And then the old woman, uh, when she hears that, she says, oh, there will be war. Because the last time we had coal in this village was right before the war. And she means the second world war, obviously. So for her, it's first time since uh, 1939, uh, probably that the call is in the village, right? Uh, and then in the next scene, when they leave the, um, the village and they have all those um, trees, we find out this is what they got in exchange uh, from this lady. So they didn't have money, uh, those uh, poor peasants probably, but they knew that there is a place uh, where, where you can get those Christmas trees. So it was an exchange instead of, you know, paying with money they pay them uh, with, with the Christmas uh, trees. Uh, so yeah, I hope that explains uh, this part. Uh, as I said, I know there's a lot uh, in there that is very complicated and I'm, I'm surprised, you know, you, you are even not more uh, lost with some, some of the, the scenes that are happening uh, in the film. Let me go back to the general meaning of that film uh, in the meantime. So, um, as I said, uh, the director was telling um, uh, his friend on the, on the radio during an interview that this film shows that uh, everybody is, is trying to, to cheat others. Everybody's lying. He says the only people that are uh, more, like, very simple and, and straightforward are those uh, poor ones at the very bottom of the society and everybody is using them. Uh, because they are the only ones who, who, who really um, don't get dirty, uh, we could say, in a way, with the system. Now, uh, let's maybe talk about the, the ending. Um, it might be surprising a little bit, because first of all, uh, the last five minutes, let's say, the last few minutes of the film, uh, changing the tone. Uh, we, it's not like funny anymore. Um, it's more like... Um, uh, it became serious uh, and melancholic uh, with the um, uh, with the song that uh, Eva Ben, a famous uh, Polish singer, um, is singing. So, um, okay, I just saw another question. So before before I talk about the ending, because we will finish with that, uh, I will ju ask, just answer to that question. And please. Uh, this is the last chance for you to, to write the questions if you have one. Well, you can always email me after. My email is at the at bottom of the chat uh, screen right now. Okay, can you talk a bit about the sanit sanitation period the film they are making is set in and contextualize any jokes make about the period? Okay, it was sanatias and I, I believe it was translated as sanation. So it's spelled a little bit differently. Well, that's the time between the wars um, when uh, um, in 1918, Poland reappeared uh, on the maps of, of Europe after uh, over 100 years of partitions. Uh, so that was between the First World War and the Second World War, so 1918 to 1939, when we were attacked uh, by the Germans. And uh, it was a period when we had um, Marszałek Piłsudski. So Marshal Piłsudski uh, became the, the head of the state. Uh, he made like a 
coup d'etat at some point and, and he, he took over. That was the time when we had strong authorities in every country, Stalin in Russia, um, Hitler in Germany, and in Poland it was uh, Piłsudski. He was not as bad though, even though he did uh, put some of his uh, opponents in concentration camp, now, camps. Now, by concentration camps, uh, we're not talking about the same thing, because at first, it was not a new idea. Hitler didn't invent it, Stalin didn't invent it. But uh, at first, concentration camps were just exactly what uh, the name says, which means you would put, concentrate people together. You would put some people, uh, it was just like political prison but it would be in a special uh, built camp. It didn't back then involve, uh, it didn't involve working. Uh, the, the, the prisoners would be fed. There were all the rules about, you know, prisoners of war. Well, in this case, they were political prisons, not of war, but similar, uh, you know, they will be treated um, much better than uh, what we think of when we think about concentration camps. Uh, so, uh, Piłsudski, uh, yeah, the time when we, when we uh, see in that film is about the, between the wars, that's what they say. But to be honest, the problem with that film is um, it's all messed up. The, the clothing, the, um, the wardrobe, right? The, the fact that they were supposed to have a hair in a sense of, uh, of hunting. Uh, now, why the hair is missing and we have a cat instead? Well, because uh, you could make a pate from a hair. And every kind of meat, as I said before, was in shortage. So people who would work at the film, uh, they ate the, the sausages. They were supposed to play the main role. Uh, well, actually, it was the producer who took it at the end, we find out. But they disappeared, right? Uh, the hairs were probably killed and eaten. Uh, by those two guys who were supposed to take care of them uh, because you know the film production would pay for it all right they would buy it they would buy all the all the food uh, and then it was supposed to be filmed they actually made the sausage uh, especially for that film because the real film Barea's film had exactly the same problems and shortages so these scenes of filmmaking are making fun kind of like it's auto auto humor they're making fun of the filmmaking at the same time. And the fact that you had to all the time uh, had a new idea and like turn over because what you wanted was not there. So you had to go on with what was there. So they have a cat instead of a, of a hair. The problem is the cat goes on the uh, tree. A hair wouldn't do that, right? And so the director has to change the idea. He says, oh, that's a good idea. Let's say this and that. And then he said, actually, it's better if it's a, a, a dog. Let's make him a dog, not a cat, you know, because he has no hair. He has to play with whatever uh, there is. Uh, but this director is obviously very, very weird as well because um, his ideas are, are sometimes surprising, like when you have old people and he decides they're going to play children. Uh, and then he says, shave them. They say, no, we will not let you shave uh, our, you know, mustache and, and beards. So he says, okay, well, they just put something around and we pretend that their teeth uh, hurt, you know, they have tooth aches. But I don't know how he wanted to explain that to the people who watch the film. So it was all very messed up. The wardrobe of the, the girl and the wardrobe of the double was obviously wrong. So there's a lot of scenes talking about what's, what's wrong with that film. And this director in some point says to the horses, uh, horses put herds down, do, does, do horses hear me? You know, so he's talking to the horses. I mean, obviously the horses will not listen to him, right? Just like the hare or the cat or the dog, whatever, will not listen to him. So it's all a little bit making fun of the film industry of the time in a, in a, in a funny way, you know, uh, so it, it is working. Uh, I believe. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of jokes really there, uh, I would say. Uh, and yeah, they are all uh, just, uh, it's more making fun of the, of the filmmaking than the period uh, they, they are filming itself. Most of the films that was made in Poland back then wouldn't be modern, wouldn't be talking about current times because that was dangerous. So they would be about the history, about the past, uh, the further, the better. Sometimes that history was used to symbolize the current times. 
because, for example, over the centuries, uh, Russia and the Germany always tried to meet in the middle, and the middle was Poland. So there was a lot of times when we would fight the Russians, so we, they, we could make a film about fighting the Russians, and then everybody would watch it and know that it's about the current situation that we should now fight the Russians again. You know? So this kind of symbolism. And talking about the symbolism, let me go back to the ending now. So the end uh, is uh, obviously connected with the title, the teddy bear. Now, what is the teddy bear uh, in this film? Uh, well, as they said, it can be anything you want it to be. It can be stupidness, it could be ignorance, it could be bad will, it could um, symbolize anything that you want that you don't like, that it's negative. The most common uh, symbolism of that scene that people see in it uh, was that it, it was the um, USSR, the, the Soviet Republic, Russia back then, communist Russia. And uh, for us, the ending of this film, when that teddy bear falls down and just gets destroyed by accident, right? That was not the plan, it just falls, but it was always the case, it was never a plan. The plan never worked, so we're not surprised that didn't work either. So this was seen as a, um, uh, as a uh, fortune telling or future telling. Uh, is some people thought that this symbolized the end of the, of the um, USSR. And only 10 days la later, when they were making the film, 10, ten years later it happened, uh, it proved to be true. And uh, the, um, you know, there were first democratic um, elections in Poland and after that uh, the Berlin Wall fell down and um, the Russian communist uh, was finished at least, and all the uh, satellite countries uh, were free. So this, uh, this uh, teddy bear uh, most common is red as a symbol of, of that, of the fall uh, of communism in a way, if you want to look at this like that. And the Polish people always knew that would happen. Uh, I mean, you know, we, we might say, oh, it's easy to say it now, right? Uh, the system feel, felt like it seems like it's never going to end, it's going to last forever. So how could Polish people know that it won't last forever? Well, because they've been fighting for freedom over and over again. And every time, you know, it would be, as we said, every second generation of Polish people, as the saying goes, uh, fights for, for independence. So we kind of knew, we had Russians before, we got rid of them. We had them again, we got rid of them. So we kind of knew this is gonna happen again. It's just a, a story that likes to uh, repeat itself. Uh, so this is the meaning of the ending of the film. Uh, I don't see any more questions here. So I will just invite you all to come back um, tomorrow after tomorrow and the day after. We have three more films to show. They will be different. So if you were a little bit confused by this one, as I said, there is a lot in it. Uh, the ones that you're going to watch will be different. Uh, no more Varea films. Uh, we love them in Poland, but because there's a lot of um, jokes and, you know, like they that might get lost in translation a little bit, a lot of new speak. So for, for us, it sounds funny. And we really like those films. Uh, but they are specific, very specific. So tomorrow we actually having a, a rom-com uh, from communist time. So I hope that will, that sounds interesting. Uh, but it's also talking about the, the communist times and yeah, power and, uh, you know, mm, social and uh, political, like it's private political and how it interferes. And after that, we have two more films, um, Sex Mission and King Size by Juliusz Machulski. And those are very Hollywood kind of films. I would say Hollywood was even interested in remaking Sex Mission, which is the most popular and famous uh, film by Machulski. I had a chance to watch it a few years ago in uh, Leeds in England at the Leeds uh, International Film Festivals. Uh, Festival. So it's a kind of film that actually been shown in the West and you might have heard of it. Um, it was like quite famous uh, back then. The re remake was never made. He did get the money for the rights, but it, yeah, it never became true. Uh, but it's, it's very, very American, I would say. So it's like a communist American film. And King Size as well. Uh, my favorite is actually King Size. I prefer it from the two, uh, but they are both very good because Machulski is the king of Polish comedy up to, up to now. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining me today. It was a pleasure as usual, and I hope to see you tomorrow. 
uh, have a nice rest of your evening now. Thank you. Bye.